Hey everybody. How y'all doing there? Good to see everybody. Had a little bit of a hang up there with the music during the loading screen. I think I was making myself a shot of espresso here and I kind of got distracted there and forgot to switch over to the next song, but good to be here. Good to see everybody. I see we've had some uh, responses to my question in the chat there. Thank you for, for turning out with that. Let's see what we've got here. Well, you know what? Actually, we're going to get to that in a minute. Before I do anything else, I promised Jason I would do this. Jason, if you're watching, this way you don't got to stick around for the whole show here. Here's what I was working on last week. I got it all wrapped up and finished here. So we did this on stream last week. This is that uh, to topi brown and cognac brown calfskin slim bifold. I say slim bifold because it has no dedicated billfold. It only has these two little flaps here that go into deep kind of side pockets there. So four card slots, two deep pockets behind them. Uh, Topi Brown Zonta calfskin with matte cognac alligator from Amten. My world. This, so having having worked with a lot of Amten colors and worked with the cognac in the glazed before, I am floored by this color. This is, this is just an absolutely beautiful, beautiful color. So I'm... Uh, very pleased to have this one wrapped up. I posted some photos of, of, of it on Instagram today. So, Jason, thank you again for, for being patient with working through all the all the colors. And I think we had like 60-some emails going through different color choices and things like that till we finally found one that we both thought looked good. So I'm, I'm glad we, we came up with this one because I, I think this is a, a real winner. So I'm going to try actually to get this out to you today here. I'm waiting on the mailman to show up. If you'll bear with me with a little bit of noise, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish taping up the package here while my espresso cools. Give me just a moment here. Got, uh, got a couple packages to go out today, so I want to make sure I get these ready for the mailman to arrive. Get a glimpse at uh, my packaging here. I just used um, crushed corrugated cardboard. I think it, it, it um, it's inexpensive. It pads things nicely, and it still looks nice. When you when you see that all in there, it actually looks looks intentional. looks looks like a gift. Makes you feel nice to open it. I know some folks get into doing this with uh, canvas bags and stuff. That's really nice. I'm a pretty slow packager. I work, I don't do a lot of volume shipping, so I'm generally shipping out one or two packages a day. Let me move this away from the microphone. And speaking of the microphone, I have it in a new position today. So please let me know how this sounds compared to the old microphone. It should sound exactly the same. But if it does sound any different, please do let me know. Questions and complaints can all be directed to my good friend and colleague, Cornelio of Cornell Leathers. He handles, he's my complaint department. Anything that goes wrong, I send to him. So if you have anything bad to say about it, just talk to Cornell. He'll take care of it for you. Uh, I hope everybody had a nice weekend. It was Father's Day over the weekend here in the United States. And also, of course, today is the celebrated holiday. It was uh, actually observed yesterday, but it's being celebrated today uh, of Juneteenth. So to everybody who has the day off, hope you're enjoying yourselves. I had a nice weekend. We did a, a small cookout in the driveway for all the various dads in the family, so that was nice. And I had uh, I had a small event, which I'll praise you on here in just a moment. So there we go. That's ready to go out in the mail. I know the mailman always loves it when I have my little sign on the door telling him to Please knock. I have packed just 
but you may recall from last week that I was dealing with, at the time, uh, a problem in my yard. And I am pleased to say that yesterday, uh, the problem was finally dealt with. So we have a, uh, we have a confirmed, well, I'm not going to necessarily say confirmed, but we have a very um, plausible suspicion that the mission was accomplished and that the groundhog will not be terrorizing any more yards here uh, in this area. So feeling pretty pleased about that. Ah, oh, that's a good shot. I don't usually have espresso, but today felt like the right kind of day for it. I'm uh, a confirmed bachelor today. My wife is over in uh, Cedar Point with her mom for the day, for tomorrow. Having a one last day of nice weather before it gets hell hot, as my mother would say. So she's up there riding roller coasters and enjoying that. But with that all out of the way, um, what I want to talk about today, I want to talk about hand tools. And in particular, I want to talk about my personal five i don't know it's kind of debatable whether they're the most used or simply my favorite hand tools but i use them a lot and i think these five tools are, are particularly important uh, and relevant to people who would be looking to just start out or beginner leather workers who are kind of trying to wade through the information uh, about what tools they should buy and there's a there's a lot of it and not all of it is good information there's a point where i actually think there's been so much discussion that we've actually muddied the waters so much that it's difficult now to actually draw an opinion for, from much of that. And you may recall from last week, I mentioned that I was trying to do a video of this. I really, I really wanted to do a video uh, of me just talking to the camera about it, uh, almost in, kind of in the style of uh, James Hoffman, if you're familiar with him, kind of coffee barista type fella. Really, really good presenter. I enjoy his presenting and his speaking style on his videos. And I thought, well, surely that... Surely I could do that. You know, I'm here talking to you right now, and I, I feel like I'm reasonably conversational on the streams and everything, so I tried it. And holy God, what a mess it was. It was horrible. It was actually... It, it was so bad, I actually went onto the camera memory cards, and I actually deleted all of the data. I wiped everything from the computer, from the memory cards, everything. It was so abysmal, I destroyed all evidence that I had ever spent those four or five hours recording down here. And um, naturally, I was pretty disappointed with that because I think the information is good. Hello, Jan. It's nice to see you here. Hello to all my regulars. Hello to, to Robert. It's good to see you. Pasala, I'm happy to see you. Roger, good to see you here. Corey, Jordan, good to see everybody. So to all of my regular friends who uh, take the time to sit here and listen to this old chunk of coal bloviate for a couple hours, I, I do appreciate it. It's good to see you. But as I was saying, um, I tried the whole talking to the camera thing, and wow, I suck at it. Holy God, I am really, really bad at it. Uh, and it gave me certainly a, a new appreciation for the people who are good at it, who are good at speaking to the camera. Um, but doing this, I don't really feel like I'm talking to a camera because, you know, I, I get to see you guys talking and chat, and it feels like I'm talking to other people, and I, effectively I am. Even though I can't see your faces, I know that you're there, but you're kind of robbed of that with just the camera in front of you, and uh, it was it was frightening. If, if I had gone up there and tried to do a bit where I was doing it like a corporate instructional video... Uh, the fitness gram pacer test, the the leather working knife is the first tool that most people and it's just it sounded like that and it was just miserable. If I'd have been standing there in like a like a button down in a suit in front of a a, a PowerPoint presentation, it might have been funny for about thirty seconds, but no, it was it was no good. It was not good. So we're gonna go over it today live. <laughs> There are, like I said, there are five tools I want to cover today. And before I do that, I'm going to take a look and I'm going to read off some of your, some of your uh, tools that you listed in here. Okay, we have the electric edge creaser, certainly, certainly a critical and I would say necessary tool for small goods. Okada skiving knife from Mr. Ren, very good. Skiving knife, very important. Everybody should have at least a decent one. Uh, I'll, I'll talk on that a little bit. Stitching hole hand pliers. I've never used those, Roger. That's interesting. I do have something to say about your topic about noise, though, and we'll come up with that. French-style saddler's clam from Robert. The clams are very interesting. I've never used one. I've only ever used my little basic... I've only ever used my little pony that I built. <laughs> and um, 
It, uh, it has some problems. It's got a wing nut sticking out of the side that tends to catch the thread. But I kind of evolved a dance around it. So, it really doesn't bother me that much. Uh, what else do we have here? Hand pliers. Floor stitching pony. Oh, Poss. Miss Poss. Very, very, very cool. I think if I was going to upgrade to a new stitching pony, I would probably do that. But I just can't can't bring myself right now to drop three, four hundred bucks on it. Although I'm certain... It is worth every single penny. Very jealous of you for that. God, they look cool, though, don't they? They look so cool. I'm, if, you, if you have any thoughts on, on using it versus some of the other ponies you use, please do put that in chat, because I, I, I think that would be, uh, be relevant to a lot of people. I know I certainly would be interested in it. And while you're at it, um, for those of you who took the time to post um, your response to that, please do, if you have Instagram or social media, Please do drop them in the chat so everybody can, can follow you. Please do do that. I'm going to start with, on, on my, uh, I'm going to kind of go through my list as I remember it here, what I, what I tried to convey uh, on my, on my uh, ill-fated video here. I'm going to go through my five tools that I, I kind of swear by here. And I'm going to start with the most important one. Uh, I think the most important tool for any leather worker is their knife. Um... And there is endless discussion about knives in the Discord chat, on leatherworker.net, on the subreddit, on Facebook. Everywhere you go, everybody has a different opinion about knives. And they're very willing to share their opinion of it, and I am no different, so here we go. Uh, everybody who knows me knows that I use this. This is about a $5 uh, antique, I think. I don't know how old it is. It certainly looks pretty old, but I'd say it's probably 60-some years old. Uh, Stanley knife. It's a $12.99, the Defiance. And I bought it because I started out using, uh, I actually still have it here. I didn't give it away. I still have it here. I started out using an X-Acto knife, like, like many people do. And, um, these certainly work great. Uh, they're, they're, they're good for certain applications. I found that, uh, it looks like I was using a number 11 blade on this. I found the blade to be a little too flimsy. And I was getting it, uh, it was bending and flexing quite a lot as I was trying to cut through my leather. Now, granted, the leather I was cutting at the time was like 6-ounce Tandy Craftsman shoulder. So it was very dense and not particularly good. And it was not a good fit for this knife. But I found myself wanting a stiffer blade, so I went on eBay. And, uh, of course, rather than finding a knife that worked, that I thought was going to work good, I found one that I thought looked cool first. And I ended up getting both. I, I got uh, I got both in the same knife. So I got this guy for five bucks. I think it cost as much to ship it as it did to buy it. And I felt foolish afterwards because I realized if I had just like gone and looked in, in my basement or in any basement here or any of my neighbors, they would have probably had a dozen of these things just sitting there and just given me one. But I really like this knife for a couple of reasons. Uh, as, as I mentioned, the first reason I bought it was because it looks very cool. Hey, John, I'm glad you joined us here. Uh, I like that it says Defiance on the side, because me, uh, I kind of lead, or rather, I fancy that I lead a life of Defiance. I, I, would, I would fancy myself a Defiant individual, although really I'm probably not. Really, probably rather milk toast when it comes down to it. And then on the other side, of course, it says Made in USA, which is uh, very important to me. I, I, I take great pride in, in where I'm from and where my goods come from. Not just in the United States, but also, you know, in Youngstown. So, Youngstown pride. And if I could have found a knife that said Made in Youngstown, I would have been using that instead. But I digress. Uh, I like the blades that it uses. These blades, you can see, are a little, a little denser than the X-Acto blades, but still fairly, they come to a nice kind of tight point at the top there. So, John, another John, good to see you there. Thank you for coming in. These blades work very effectively for most things that I do. I do largely small goods, so I am doing, you know, tight corners, tight cuts, things like that. And even though this is not a particularly tiny blade, it is small enough to work around those angles and tight spaces. So it does, um, it does everything I need it to do. Uh, the blades are very sharp, and in particular for the blades, uh, there are as many different types of blades as there are knives for these, but I'm using the Lennox Gold Blades. Uh, I find that these tend to hold an edge longer. They come sharper out of the box. Uh, and they're still not particularly expensive for how long they last and how many you get in a box. So, having been using them now for like five years, I'm still only on my second box. And I change the blade 
basically every every time or actually every other time I start a project if, if I've been cutting through something that's pretty soft oftentimes I can reuse the blade for another another you know piece uh, generally I will change them out when I start cutting alligator because it is so dense it will dull them very quickly that's usually the times I do that but again the Lennox gold blades um, People make a big deal out of fixed blade knives, and I think that's kind of disingenuous because it, unfortunately, I see a lot of people coming in, you know, especially new leather workers, and they're looking at like getting the, the wind dispensable knives or, God forbid, dropping two, three hundred dollars on a, a charter made skiving knife or something like that. And uh, I think that's a bad idea for most people starting off. I, I think you're going to spend a lot of money for something that does not cut any better out of the box than this knife does. One of the big points I, I wanted to stress in the video is that for most people, and by that I mean probably easily 90%, and actually probably 95% of leather workers do not need any more knife than this. Uh, I know plenty of people use head knives. I know plenty of people you know, do all their work with like a Japanese skiving knife. But for somebody looking to, to get into leather working and just say, I need a knife, I need a knife that will cut, this will do it, and it will do everything. I mean, you, everything that you need to do cutting-wise, other than skiving and even to some extent you can still do with this uh this knife will do and it costs five bucks i think off the shelf they maybe cost eight or nine bucks now you can go to any hardware store and get one you get a pack of blades with them they last a long time for um cost versus usability i think these are hard to beat so anybody looking to start out i recommend just getting a basic stanley knife um Another reason I like this knife versus newer versions of this, uh, my, my dear friend Arub very kindly sent me, she, she laughed at, uh, at what an old and ugly knife I was using, so she sent me some of the newer Stanley knives with like the, the snap-off blades, and uh, I tried using it, and it works as well as this. It, you know, obviously there is no difference between them other than the way the knife sits in there, but I find that this being an older knife, it seems to be about uh, three quarters to an inch shorter than off-the-shelf Stanley knives now. They, they seem to be bigger today than they than they were back then. And me being a, a little guy, that matters quite a bit. This knife ended up being the actual perfect size to fit my hand. It is so comfortable in my hand. I could flip it around. I can, you know, I can do this, that with it. Any kind of way I need to hold that knife, I can do it. And I can shift positions just by flipping it in my hand. I don't need to, to swap hands to change the way I hold the knife. It's very, very comfortable for me for its smaller size. So that's another reason I use this particular knife versus, like, a newly made one. But other than that, they are identical. Hey, neighbor! <laughs> My neighbor's going for a walk. Other than that, it's, it's identical to any off-the-shelf Stanley knife right now. Hey, no problem, Jason. I'm, I'm glad you like it. I'm just waiting for the mailman here. It's in that pile of packages going out there later today. But, uh, like you said, Tom, you know, people get in there and... and I see people, there was a fellow who came in, and um, he, he was going to start leatherworking, and he bought, like, all these nice tools, like, easily $100 knives and everything, and he never made anything. He spent so much money buying all the nicest, quote-unquote, tools he could get, and then he never made anything, and now he's selling them all off. And I hate to see that. I hate to see people getting sunk in with not a small degree of cost uh, for something that they find is not to their liking in the first place. So... This knife, again, I am convinced it just it just can't be beat. As far as uh, you know, another thing that people get confused about is like head knives and things like that. Head knives and other types of fixed knives are great, um, but most of them, and in particular head knives, have very specific use cases. As we often say in, uh, in in shop talk in the Discord chat, I think very few people have need for a head knife. Like if you're not a saddle maker, you probably don't need one. If you use one and you like it, that's great. Certainly, far be it for me to tell you not to use it, but again, people kind of think that that's, that's the tool that you use if you're making wallets and whatever, and while you can, I don't think it's any better than this. And another thing to consider with these knives is also maintenance time. Um, I know people swear by their, their skiving knives or head knives or whatever, but go try to sharpen it while I change the blade with a flathead screwdriver and put it back together in like 10 seconds. And then come back and tell me you feel the same way. Like, you know, it's, it's just, I think it has so many advantages over, over fixed blade knives that, again, unless you need it, I don't think you should bother. I don't think you should bother with them. I think this knife will do everything you need and probably much better for the same price.
and probably significantly less. Yeah, my, my, one of the points I had written down that I thought was good in my, uh, and, and of course, correct me if I'm wrong, this is what I thought was good. Um, a cheap disposable blade or a cheap replaceable blade knife will almost always be better than a cheap fixed blade knife. And in most cases, it will probably be better or as good as an expensive one. That was that was kind of what I what I ended that segment on there. So if you agree with me, that's great. If you disagree, let me know. We can fight about it. And I say this, um, I know this is a controversial opinion of mine. I, I know that plenty of people use different kinds of knives for everything. Um, I do not say this to, to try to indicate that anybody is wrong or, or disparage anybody in any way. I more so just kind of want to cut through the, uh, the chaff for somebody who is just starting out and has no idea what kind of knife they need. You don't need anything more than this if you just want to sit here and make wallets. If you want to make shoes or if you want to make saddles or something different, you may look at a different knife. For what I do, this is all the knife that I need. And that's the important thing is that when I say, you know, 90% of people, that's what I mean. I mean for most people, not everybody. Some people need those knives, but you will know when you need it. Um, if you have one of these and you're using it, you think, oh, damn, I need to do this. You'll know that that's a time when you need to look at another knife. And if you have to end up buying another knife, congratulations, you spent a whole, like, eight or nine bucks on this one, and you're not out any significant sum of money if you have to change it. So, yeah, I, I think they're great. I actually, um, hilariously, I, I get made fun of quite a bit for this. I will strop and hone my blades on this little, uh, the, uh, the Lansky knife sharpening system that, uh, my good friend Nanique, God rest his soul, used to make endless fun of me for using. But it works great. Like I said, most of the times you can just give them a quick hone, one swipe on each one, and it works good as new. And I know that technically wears through the finish on them, but who, who gives a shit? You know, you change the knife out and that's it. So it's it's nuts. And, and yeah, like it, it's um that's a, another great point, Tom, or Thomas or Tom, whichever you prefer, forgive me. Um, you can feel... There are people who will make you feel like you're doing it wrong if you're not using a traditional tool. Um, what a what a load of horse dump, you know? It's just just nonsense. I think most of those people probably prescribed the uh, the the hands not machines hashtag movement, which is another silly thing. But we'll save that for another day. I want to focus more or less specifically on hand tools today because um it's it, these. Every leather worker does most of their core leather working with hand tools, and they're the first tools people buy as beginners. So I wanted to uh, to focus on that, mostly because they're accessible, but also because they, this is core leather working. Everything I do is done with this knife and all these other tools that I use. Uh, Joran, I, I ended up... So I was disappointed. My first box, I don't know how many it had. So both of the boxes I bought came in like this package here. And um, the first one had like a hundred blades in it. Yeah, it actually had a hundred. There was a little thing on there. This one I bought for the same price a couple years later, and I only got fifty out of it. So that's a bunch of that's a bunch of crap right there. But even so, I'll have to look back and see when I bought this. I still have about twenty blades left in there. So I've only gone through like thirty or so blades, and I know I bought this easily like two or three years ago. Well, maybe not that long, but long enough. You know, it, for what it cost me. If I get a year out of it, you know, big deal. It's not not that not that hard. Not that hard money wise. So we'll put the knife aside there. Hello. Hello from the United States. Welcome Belgium. Welcome the Mad Kazi. My next tool kind of goes hand in hand. Well, no, it doesn't. Oh, here it is. I do remember where I put it. I had to, when I was filming, I had torn my, I had torn my workshop all to pieces to try to make the camera fit. So I had to put everything back, and I kind of forgot where I put everything. I didn't put it in its usual spot. So if I'm hunting around for things, forgive me. But um, this was the next tool I want to talk about. This is actually, this will be the most expensive tool I talk about today that can't really be replaced by something else. Um, all the other tools, I'll try to give an example. If I have an expensive version of the tool, I will try to give an equivalent example of a less expensive version that works just as well. Very important. But this is the only one that I really recommend actually spending any degree of money on. 
And this is uh this is my Berry King 24 ounce tapered maul. And these right now cost about 70 bucks from the manufacturer. So after shipping in the United States, you'll spend around 80 bucks on one of these. Um why do I recommend the maul and why do I think it's more important than the implements it is meant to strike, like pricking irons, things like that? Uh the maul is is one of those tools that I guess you call it a force multiplier. Uh it is used for many different applications. Uh, it is not, you know, a pricking iron is a pricking iron. It does its one thing. A hole punch is a hole punch. That is what it does. But all of them rely on this tool to function properly. And any any other number of things that you could be doing with them all, rivet setting, you know, snap setting, all of that, so on and so forth, uh, they all rely on, number one, a good striking surface, and number two, a good striking implement. And I actually came to the game late with this. I started off using a rubber mallet, like I think many people do. Uh, and that function, you know, it, it worked, it did what it needed to do, but not very well. And I had always seen people using uh, malls and things on YouTube. So I bought, of course, the cheap Chinese, uh, like, $9 mall on eBay. And I, unsurprisingly, I was somewhat disappointed by it. I felt like it didn't offer me a lot more functionality than just the rubber mallet did. And I used that for a shockingly long period of time. I used it for, like, two years before uh, my good friend Ben finally got on my ass and was like, hey, you need to get a better mall. I was like, and I thought at the time that, you know, how good can it be? How, how much of a difference really can it, you hit things with it? It's, it's a damn hammer. How much difference can there possibly be? And wow, was I ever wrong. From, from the moment I picked this tool up, I was like, oh, oh, this is, this is noticeably better. Even I hadn't even hit anything with it yet. Just holding it in my hand, it's like, oh my god, this feels so much nicer. Just with the, the polished leather handle and everything, it's like instantly this felt like a better tool. And that's, of course, because it is. I think the weight is important. A lot of the malls you'll get uh, from Amazon and eBay are very light. I think they're only like 12 to 16 ounce, and that's functional. But when you're doing this, you really, you really want some more heft behind it. I think 24 ounce is the lightest I would go. Uh, I know they make them in like 36 ounce, and Ben, that mad animal, I think his is like 64 ounce, some insane weight on it. It's uh, it's ridiculous how, how large his is, but I find 24 ounce works very nicely for mine. And for a couple of reasons, um, let me scroll up and see who it was who'd mentioned it. Now, Roger, in particular, you, you brought up the, the problem of noise, and that's a, that's a big problem for people living, you know, in noise-unfriendly environments. I know some people switch to, uh, you know, uh, arbor presses and things like that, and those are great, but they take a, they're, they're kind of a pain. They, they have to set them up. You have to make sure it works properly. They're not just the kind of thing you pick up and use. <laughs> Stephanie, hello! It's good to see you. I'm glad you tuned in. Thank you so much. Stephanie is uh, is on Instagram as Lesbian EDC, and she, I sent her one of my very first wallets. She was the first person to ever, she was the first person other than me to take a picture of one of my wallets, and I thought that was just so damn cool. So she's doing some amazing work with Shell. Check it out. It's fantastic. I, I'm glad you joined in. You've, you've joined in with me uh, talking at length about tools here, so feel free to sound off if you have any opinions about it. But as I was, I was getting about the weight, I think having this tool, which is a little heavier and much sturdier built, I find, obviously I'm striking, I have to put less force behind it because the maul kind of takes, takes up some of that weight for me. But the fact that it's not vibrating around, you know, we're not rattling, even though I'm delivering more force per strike, I find that it is quieter than the cheaper mauls and actually quieter than the rubber mallet, which you wouldn't think for it being a hard nylon surface. I swear to you it is. Um, I found a significant improvement in, in noise from using a better maul. So right off the bat, that's an improvement that I think would be of note to, to many people. Um, noted, and I'll say this now, I was going to say it for the end, but you will find conspicuous by their absence in this talk today, I'm not really going to talk about pricking irons much. And because I think, uh, I don't think they matter that much. I think that what you hit them with matters a lot more than the pricking irons you're using. Because if, if you look out there, if you look like on Facebook and all the places where people still kind of focus more on like Tandy tools, people are doing amazing work with Tandy, just like basic Tandy diamond chisels. And they're getting clean stitches. They get nice, nice clean holes. Like, 
your your stitching irons matter to some degree, but in terms of like getting a good quality product and a nice stitch, you don't need a hundred, two hundred dollar set of ch chisels to do that. You can do it with cheaper chisels if you're good at it and if you're making clean holes with it. And that's where this comes in. You can have a very no frills kind of basic, almost I would almost borderline say dull set of chisels, and this will drive them through pretty cleanly. Now, obviously, you don't want to use dull chisels if you can avoid it, but if you take, I guarantee if you take a set of Tandy chisels or any kind of cheap set, Amy Roke, whatever, something from Amazon, and drive them with this, you'll probably get halfway decent results out of it if you try hard enough. So I, I think that the thing that matters more to it is getting good with your tools and using a good striking implement. And like I said, that's one facet of this tool. That's not even getting into setting rivets, setting snaps, hole punches, everything you can do that relies on a striking implement, all of that. Every single one of those is improved by this one tool. So, yes, it costs 80 bucks, but it's used for many different things. It is not a single-use item. I, I swear to God, please get one. It is worth every penny. I think they're fantastic. A note on the taper. Roger, you, you said you couldn't adjust the tapering aspect of it. That's okay. They make them in you know the straight versions, too. Whatever you prefer. I, I find that I quite like the taper because it, it if you can kind of... I don't know how much you can tell in that. It, um, it's not a, a lot, but it does kind of shallow out the angle at which your wrist needs to be when you're striking. And if you're doing it a lot, that little bit can add up over time. So for me, you know, I, I'm, I'm here doing this every day. I find that to be very comfortable to me. Um, so I, I prefer the taper. Uh, another note about the Barry King tools with the maul versus the hammer. There's, there's a great debate for that. And again, you know, whichever you prefer, whichever is comfortable to you, they're great tools no matter how they're set up. I think that the maul is superior from a speed standpoint, in that when you pick up a hammer, you have to make sure that that thing is indexed. Like, if you try to hit it on the side, it'll skate off and you'll, you'll ruin something. There is no such problem with the maul. Every time you pick up the maul, it doesn't matter how you pick it up, it is indexed, because it's, it's round. So once you get enough practice with, you know, hitting in the center, which takes much less time than you would think just by doing it, um... You can pick this up instantly without looking at it. You do not have to look at the maul. You will know by the way it feels that you're holding it, and you'll be holding it right no matter how you pick it up. And you can instantly go and strike with it. So from a speed and convenience standpoint, I think it is superior in that regard. Uh, oh, Stephanie, you're going you're gonna to make me blush on camera. Thank you. I, I, having worked a little bit with shell, I was, I was comparing my, uh, my shell work to your edges. I'm like, oh, god damn, she, she's, got, she's got my number on this. I can't touch it. She's fantastic, so... Beautiful, beautiful work on your burnishing. I, I love it. Let me take a moment. I'm just reading some of the comments here. Just real quick, be, because you asked, Bruce, I'll show you. Um, like I said, I don't want to talk too, too much about pricking irons, but I'm sure we'll get into it again anyway. Uh, right now, I'm using the, the Jun Lin set that Ellen Valentine carries from Leatherwork School. Uh, these are three millimeter spacing, so nine stitches per inch. Um, I really, really like these. And for the price, my God, I don't think you can go wrong. Uh, I, I think they're listed at 180 bucks, and you get three irons with them. You get the 10 tooth, the 2 tooth, and the 5 tooth, which not everybody will need the 5 tooth, but I do on some of my uh, tighter radii. So I really like having the 5 tooth on it. Um, the maximum thickness I've gone through these cleanly is about a quarter inch. I try not to make anything thicker than that because that's that's getting that's getting pretty hefty there. You you don't want anything that thick, but they'll do it without without trouble. So I think these are easily pretty equivalent to the to the KS blade for a, a bit less of a price. Let's see here. If the, yeah, if the teeth spacing is not consistent, that's a problem. That's troublesome. I think I missed someone's question. Let me scroll up real quick. Jan, forgive me, I'm, I'm coming to you late on this one. You asked, how tight of a cut can I do with that knife? Um, I can do a quarter inch to three eighths inch radius on them pretty easily. Uh, and that takes a bit of doing. You have to really be careful to hold the knife upright, and it's a little awkward. I generally prefer to use a punch for that, but you can do it by hand if you need to. So pretty... Pretty tight. Um, I realize now that again, going, I, I switched away from the X-Acto knife 
early on because I was using pretty heavy leather. I was using like six ounce leather and it was very dense. So it was not good for that. But for the stuff I'm doing nowadays with like under, you know, sub one millimeter thick leather, the X-Acto knife will easily do that. But I'm so used to holding that knife now that I just use it for everything. I, I actually would probably perform worse if I tried to switch to a knife I was unfamiliar with in the middle of doing it. I, I hope that answers your question. Forgive me for coming to that late. I, I hope I didn't miss you. I'm trying to recall here. I think that's everything I had to say about the mall. Um, again, how do, how do you feel about it? What do you think? Am I, am I talking out my rear end here? Let me know. Don't, don't say anything if you agree with me. Only say anything if you want to have a fight. I'm here to fight. <laughs> we'll, we'll put that guy away. Um, this is the next one I want to talk about. This is a very underrated and often maligned and ignored tool. This is getting back into the uh, the inexpensive tools. So like I said, that the, the Berry King Mall will be the most expensive tool I talk about today that cannot be replaced with something adequately adequate in quality and less expensive. You know, equivalent quality, less price. Um, there are some other ones that, that I'm going to talk about that will be more expensive than that, but I will give you examples that work, in my opinion, just as well and cost a lot less. So that one there, 80 bucks, is about the top. I think that's about the, the highest price you would need to spend if you want to get a good tool just starting out as a leather worker. You can certainly function with the cheaper malls, but it'll suck. Like, you'll be doing it, you'll think, oh man, this, this sucks, this is, this is not fun. And they're not. They're not fun to use. That tool is fun to use. Every time I pick that up, I think, oh, I have this and I get to use it. I, I enjoy using that mall. And uh, I was thrilled. When I first started using it, I was like, what a, what a fool I was to have not bought this sooner. So if you're on the fence about a mall, like I said, if you're, if you're thinking about it, and you don't think it matters that much, I thought the same thing, and I, I am here to tell you I was wrong. I apologize uh, to myself. <laughs> Do yourself a favor and, and, and pick it up. If you have a friend or a colleague nearby who has one who will let you try it, go try it and you'll see. Like I said, it is, um, it's fantastic. I, I, I just love it. I... I I know these are American-made tools, so they're a little awkward to ship overseas because of the weight. I do not have a good analog for somebody overseas making these. I know Palo Santo is a, is a well-regarded uh, toolmaker. Having not personally used their tools, I, I'm hesitant to say that they're equivalent, but I know plenty of people swear by them. So I would advise, you know, do your own research, see what you think. But if you can get the Berry King, I like the Berry King a lot. Uh. <laughs> Tom, I I, uh, I confess you've piqued my interest. I would love to see what your mall is. Is one of those wood blocks? Just a, I you know, kelp was making fun about the Japanese guys who just use a chunk of wood. If it works for you, it works. You know, whatever. But getting on with it, like I was saying, this is a tool that nobody ever talks about. It is the humble sanding block, and uh, it matters a lot. Oh yeah, the yeah, the, the Burger King Mall, I'm, I'm, see, you, I'm glad you agree with me. The Burger King Mall is a game changer. Absolutely. But this, this sanding block I got for, I think, $8 from Artisan Leather Supply. It's kind of shaped like a little trapezoid, or not trapezoid, a little wedge there. I have the trapezoidal one, too. Where did I put it? Yeah, here it is. have this one as well. From them again i think it's like five bucks uh i've never used it because i just find this one works so damn well but these are very cheap um why do i think these are so important uh, those of you who know me will recall that i before i was doing this i come from an automotive painting background and i can tell you explicitly and categorically that sanding with a hard block is not the same as sanding with the palm or flat of your hand uh, any body man or any body tech worth their salt will back me up on this. It is not the same. They are very different. That is not to say that you cannot get good results by sanding with the flat of your hand. Plenty of people do. But you will get them quicker and more efficiently using a sanding block. Where do I use this? Uh, if you watched my burnishing presentation, uh, you'll have noticed that I, uh, I use these quite extensively on water burnishing. And that's really... Where I, where I use these most. Uh, I generally use these during the finishing stage, uh, during burnishing. 
I don't use them as much during the kind of intermediate prep or construction stage. I have a different tool that I use for that, which we'll talk about later. These are more end game tools for me. Um, generally, after my first water burnish pass, I'll then go over it aggressively with uh, with the, the sanding block. And the purpose of it is to when you're when you're burnishing an edge, the goal is to reduce the high and low spots so that you have a smooth, glassy finish. Um, and this does that more efficiently than doing that with your hand. Uh, when you're block sanding, for example, when I would wet sand a car, I'd use a medium soft block behind that. Or if you're block sanding, you know, like a build primer or something like that, I would use a hard block, a long block for that. And the reason that is, is that the surface of your hand will conform to small high and low spots on uh, surfaces of cars and things like that. Now, granted, on a high gloss automotive paint finish, uh, it matters a lot more. You're going to see it a lot more. But with stuff like Stephanie's doing, uh, with high-gloss shell cordovan edges, I think it matters just as much because any small imperfection, any little nick, any little high or low or rise, you're going to see in that shine. So you want it to be very smooth. And this, if you use it with an aggressive cutting sandpaper, uh, you'll get that very quickly. Like I said, you can certainly do it by using the palm of your hand or using whatever, but you're going to spend a lot of time and you're going to use a lot of sandpaper. When you're trying to get things out the door, you know, when you have kind of a time frame to, to meet, which, you know, anybody doing this on a production basis does, uh, you, want to, you want to do it efficiently. So there's, for how much this tool costs, like I said, eight bucks, uh, there is no reason not to be using one. I mean, you can get one uh, for free. Any Anything that is, you know, long and hard like this can be a sanding block. Rulers work great for this. Uh, I've seen countless body techs using uh, Bondo spreaders with, with sandpaper on them or the classic uh, paint mixing sticks. Uh, the little, uh, we had the bamboo ones at my shop, but some of the, the nice kind of pine ones are very good because they're, they're longer and flatter. Anything flat can be a sanding block. It doesn't need to be one of these. I just like these because they're easy to attach the paper to. They have this little screw-in cap on the back. But literally, if you have a ruler in your house, use it. Put a piece of sandpaper on it and try it, and you will see that it is it is better. The key thing to note with that is if you're using a high-grit sandpaper, it immediately nullifies the effectiveness of it. These are not for use with high grit, so don't use it with anything higher than 400. And I think 400 even is a little high. I know Tang goes down to 220 grit. I find that 320 is, is the best one for cutting edges down. Um, that's my personal preference on it. Uh, edge paint as well, and, and actually in particular even edge paint. When you want to take it down, because you always get, everybody who's, who does edge painting knows about the valley, the ridge that you get when it dries in certain kind of, kind of weather. Uh, you'll get that little valley in there. If you want to cut that, use the block. Because if you use your hand, it will just follow the shape of the paint. And I know, I know that sounds crazy. I, I know it sounds nuts. I, I, um, this is another thing where I really thought, where I really thought, sixty years of uh, of body technology didn't matter until I, you know, I, I, you know, I learned by doing it by talking with my body man. He was like, "Hey, you know, use a block." I'm like, "Yeah, it's a, it's a bunch of shit." What are you talking about? He's like, "No, here, use a block." And he instantly came over and, and immediately like finished the thing I'd been spending fifteen minutes on. It's like, "Oh my god, you were right. I should have listened to you." It's almost like having a lot of experience means you know what you're talking about. Um, Again, to reiterate the point on this one being, for, for how much these cost, they are peanuts. They cost nothing. Uh, you should have one. Just just get one and have one. Um, on higher grits, and, and Steve, thank you for, for asking me to clarify on that. Uh, I, the block is really meaningless on higher grits. Um, it matters much more with lower grit than higher grit. You can use it with higher grit, but you're not going to get the same effectiveness out of it. Really, a higher grit is not for cutting, it's for polishing. And by that, I mean the work of truing up the edge, the work of making the edge flat is done by these low grit sandpapers. Um, the consequence of that being that they leave sanding marks in there, so you have to take those out. That's what the higher grits do. Getting up into 600 and 1500 grit sandpaper, you are polishing out the sanding marks that you left with this sandpaper. That's what it does. And that's how you get to that high degree of shine. Once all those little infinitesimally small sanding marks are out, that's when you start getting in those nice deep shines there. Um, 
my usual sanding steps, I'll usually go from 320 to 600, and then I'll finish with tokenol with uh, 1500. I actually use water for, for everything other than the, the very final burnishing pass. Um, again, I, I talk about this in more detail. There was a live stream I did a couple weeks back where I did a, a burnishing test, and I kind of showed my whole process of it. Uh, if you're curious about that, go check that one out. Uh, foam sanding blocks are, are good for external radii. Very good point. You can certainly use those for that. Um, I use, because I'm so comfortable with the block, I use it for everything. So I use it for going around corners, you name it. But you can certainly use a foam block for going around an external radius. Yes, absolutely. That is a great case where you actually don't want to put as much pressure on there because you'll sand, if you're, if you're working on paint in particular, you will immediately sand through it. Uh, on, on the on the corners. So these things here are most effective on long flat edges, usable on corners, but the foam sanding block is, is good for that. You know, probably more appropriate for that. If you're comfortable with it, you know, go ahead and use the hard block. But a soft or medium block will certainly do you just fine. Um, that is a case where actually kind of using the flat of your hand kind of almost is a, a soft block in, in a way um, where you can just kind of get it and kind of go over it real quick like that. That would be one case where I would say, yeah, you're fine doing it. But for everything else, use the sanding block. So again, these I got from Artisan Leather Supply. Uh, you can make one. You can get them at Harbor Freight, I think. Or you can literally take a piece of masking tape and tape your sanding paper to a ruler and be just as well. It's just a little less convenient to uh, do it. Again, I like these because they have this nice little block on the back that tensions the paper for you. I'm, uh, I'm very fond of these. Text from my wife. Again, my wife has uh, gone to Cedar Point today, so I'm here alone. I can talk as much as I want. <laughs> Put those aside there. I think that's everything I had to say about the sanding block. I realize I kind of got... Uh, I, I have a tendency to speak a little quickly, and my thoughts become kind of stream of consciousness on that. So if I miss anything or I was unclear on that, please do let me know. Um, it's the kind of thing where having done it for so many years in, in various applications, I kind of, I feel like everybody knows what I'm talking about, and that clearly is not the case. So if I was unclear about something or, or you have a question, please do let me know. Uh, I kind of, I kind of rambled on that one. Forgive me. <laughs> the point where I almost forgot what my next one was going to be here. Okay, yeah, here we go. So when I talked about using that on edges, more for the finishing stage rather than like assembly and prep work stage. I said I had another tool that I use for that. That is that is this one. This is my uh, and this is the only tool here that is more expensive than the the uh, Berry King Mall. But I have another one that I think is almost as good. That is much less expensive. So I'm going to show you both. These are our edge planes. Like I said, this is the Okada plane. Last I checked, I want to say these guys cost around a hundred bucks, which is steep. Um, they're expensive. I think most of that cost is in the blade rather than just a little chunk of wood, but they are nicely made. So I got mine second hand. No regrets. I think I paid like 50 bucks for it. I bought it from uh, Michael Strickland of Oil Strickland. One of the best purchases I ever made. Why is this a good tool? Why do I use this so much? I do, when I'm assembling pieces, I cut everything flush. So when I make my raw cut pieces, I cut them all oversized, and then I trim them to size after they've been assembled. Even with that, I sometimes end up cutting on a slight angle, or sometimes after hammering stitches or, or things like that, I find that I have some puckering or, or things that just aren't quite aligned up just right, or the edge is just a little rough, and I want to take it down very quickly to prepare it either for marking lines for stitching or getting ready to start burnishing or things like that. These tools are basically doing a similar task to what the, the uh, sanding block does, but they are much more aggressive because they're actually, you know, they're shaving that edge down. So I, I use this on, on pretty much everything I make. I, I find it almost indispensable for, for getting a good edge. Um, and it's kind of... I have difficulty explaining the differences in why I would use this versus when I would use a sanding block because they are interchangeable in many respects. 
So I, I'm grieved to say I don't have a whole lot to say about when I would use this versus when I would use that. It's just the kind of thing that you, you know it when you use it. Um, as far as getting a... This is a lot to ask for somebody to just try out. Like I said, it's, they're very expensive when you can get them. They're not always available because they're kind of made in smallish batches. Um, if you want to try out a hand plane, I got this from Harbor Freight and a pack of three for 15 bucks. So the net price on this one is a whopping five bucks. Now, they don't look like this out of the box. In fact, I, I have one. Hang on. I have the other two here. Let me find them. Yeah, here we go. Yeah, perfect. And they come in a, they come in a pack of three. And there are different shapes and, and sizes. But they look like this out of the box. I think this shape is very important. This kind of rocking rocking uh, horse shape. It's really actually critical to have. You'll notice that a lot of places sell these little planes, but they're all flat bottom. And I think that's a mistake. This rocking rocking chair, rocking horse bottom is very important because it lets you control the way this blade interacts with the edge that you're trying to shave. And that matters a lot. Uh, I know a lot of people come in, the, like the Discord, and they say, oh, I'm trying to use this plane, and it sucks. It's, all it's doing is chattering and, and ruining the edge. And uh, I, I genuinely do think that has to do with the fact that they are flat-bottomed. I think that makes it much harder to control the blade. Because it's easy to, to, to get them... It's easy to, to let it go loose on you and, and really dig in and, and you know mess something up. So when I'm holding it, you're really trying to get it as shallow of an angle on there as you can. So using that, that angle to your advantage is critical. And it takes a lot of practice. Uh, these are not the kind of tools that you just pick up immediately and intuitively use. It takes a lot of futzing around. It takes a lot of ruining some edges to, to figure out how most effectively to use this. But once you get good at it, you can pick it up and just immediately true up an edge. I mean, you're, you're talking like under 10, 15 seconds and you're done. And it's, it's all flat and nice and everything like that. It's still very rough, so it's not something you can immediately go and burnish to a nice effect like this would leave you. This is more for in the process of assembling or if you if you have glue seeping out of the edge or things like that, and you just want to take it right down and do it. Um, again, like I said, the main cost, I believe, in this one comes in this blade. This is actually a very nicely forged uh, blade. It is a forged blade. You can see it's, it's got that Japanese kind of cup shape on the bottom of it there. So it's a hell of a nice piece of steel. Um, the Harbor Freight blade naturally sucks. The burrs on it are so big you can see them without, you can just see them with your naked eye. You just look at it and see the burrs on it. So those are pretty bad. I took this and I marked it out with a magic marker and I hand filed it to this shape. So for, for about an hour of hand filing, you have a belt sander or a hacksaw, whatever you want to, you know, do, grind it down. You can take it, make it more or less this shape, pretty, pretty close to it. All you got to do is round it off into the kind of boat bottom shape. And I find that this works very well. For being a, a an essentially a $5 net price tool, it's pretty damn good. You have to sharpen the blade and you have to keep it sharp, which is the, the big difference between these two. But for the low cost of entry, you could easily try one and see oh yeah, this, this this works for me, I'll get a better one. So, if you have a Harbor Freight, or if you're in Kanukistan, uh, Princess Auto, uh, they carry them, like I said, pack of three, 15 bucks. This one that has the blade in the middle on like 45, 50 degrees, this is the one I did it with. There's, there's two different ones. These you can just kind of keep and hold them on for wherever. The skiving knife, you can use it for uh, for doing that. I, I <laughs> you're, you're a bolder man than me, my friend. I've tried doing that, and I've usually made a mess every time I've done it. So if you're skilled enough to where you can use the, the skiving knife, I salute you. Well done. I am not that good. <laughs> no matter how much I use that skiving knife, I've never got particularly good with it. But um, like I said, these tools, I, I find I use them on everything I make. Every single thing I make, I end up using the plane on. Even if I can feel the edge and it feels pretty good to me, I will still plane it before, again creasing it before marking out a stitch line. After stitching, I find particularly effective for this because even with thinner, softer leathers, when you're tensioning your stitches, it will pucker a little bit. So this I find very effective for, for truing that up very quickly. Um, I, I just, I love these tools and I, I think they're so useful that I think everybody should have one. Um, no, these are, my Okada came bevel up. 
So my plane is bevel up. I haven't tried it bevel down, but again, I don't think it matters so much. Again, with this with this rounded bottom here, you can really shallow out that angle on there to where I think it would matter. I think the bevel shape or the bevel direction would matter very much on a flat bottom plane. This one here, because you have so much control over it, I find the the shape of the bevel doesn't matter that much. So I can I've kind of learned the way I need to hold it. I can kind of go in and scoop it down and just get it to just kiss the edge there. The point where it's almost taking off just dust rather than actual full shavings of it is how little it's taking off. But it's so sharp that it, it does it and it works it works exceptionally well. These are exceptionally good and useful tools for small goods. Um and I, I really think probably for larger goods too, especially with, with you know thicker, denser leather, it's very good. I use these almost exclusively on, on straight edges, Jan. Um, I don't think I have anything to give an example on. Now, a flat a flat plane would be good if it is perfectly aligned, but it it differs with leather. The way the angle that you'll have this blade interact when, say, uh, planing batero or bridle is different from what you would have with doing something soft like shav or, or, or Minerva box or something like that. So having that control. I think really does matter quite a lot. If you're using a flat bottom plane and it works for you, that's excellent. This is simply my opinion from, from using these for so long. I really do think that the, the, the rocking chair bottom is pretty critical to why these tools work so well compared to why so many people seem to have trouble with the, uh, the other ones. Uh, there are intermediate grade versions of these, but I don't think they're particularly different. They might have a nicer blade than this. They probably do. But again, for like 20 bucks, I think Artisan Leather Supply, again, carries certain flat bottom planes. I know Rocky Mountain and all the other ones do. Uh, those ones there, again, you could probably sand to this shape as well. So if you don't have one, I, I, I recommend trying it. I, I think they're very useful tools. Uh, I think I'm going to take a break real, real quick, grab some mint tea. My throat's getting a little dry here. So let's take five, let's hit the head, grab some, some water, we'll come back, and uh, again, anything that I'm not explaining clearly or whatever, leave me a message in chat, I'll try to address it there, but I'll be back in, in two or three minutes, get yourself a drink, we'll, uh, we'll come back to it here.
All right. We're back. I was, uh... I got up to go make my tea. I took a look out the door to see if the mailman was down the street, and then I realized it. You don't. It's a federal holiday. It's Juneteenth. There is no mail today, so... If everybody who I promised whose package would be going out today, it will, in fact, be going out tomorrow. <laughs> For everybody who sat through that uh, little diatribe there, could you tell that I was on espresso versus coffee this time? Could you tell there was a difference? <laughs> I feel like I can. Uh, all right. Let's see, what did we do here? We did, did the knife, the sanding block, the planer, the mall. What was the last one? Oh, okay. I remember what the last one was. Let me clean up my bench here a little bit. <clears throat> Here, I'm going to put back away. I've yet to find a use for the other mini planes. They're very cool. I, I saw them, oh, they're brass and wood. Me being a, a big fan of the way brass looks, I, I couldn't say no. I had to have them, so I immediately went out and bought them. And I was very pleasantly surprised to find that they could, in fact, be adapted to this use. So, again, 15 bucks at Harbor Freight, net price of 5 for one. Get them. Just go get one. Or hell, spend spend a couple bucks more, and you'll buy one of the uh, the flat bottom ones from from any of the uh, your RML or any place carrying one. I think I need to I think I need to sip my tea for a second before I go into the next one. Ah. All right. The last one I have is, is a little different. And kind of ironically, I don't actually use it for every every project. But it's another uh, Burger King tool, the Berry King. It's my Berry King Edge Beveler. And I have two of them. I have Hold on. Wait, we have a visitor. Ah. Oh, you're going to be so bad. Your mom isn't home, and that means you think you can be bad. You're such a bad cat. You're so bad. What are you doing? He knows he gets his lunch exactly an hour from now. In exactly one hour, he knows he's supposed to get lunch. But he's ever the opportunist. He thinks every day, yeah, maybe, I can get it. maybe I can get it sooner. Maybe I can get it an hour sooner. But that's too much. Half an hour I could tolerate. Half an hour could be a good, haha, mom's away, we'll feed the cat early. But an hour? No, that's too much. That's ridiculous. She would never allow that. That's, that's nonsense. Don't be ridiculous. What's going on? This is Dima. What a big boy he is. This is, a, this is Dima. He is an 18-pound tabby. He is a big boy. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Tom, I, I think all cats are the same. I don't think he's I don't think he's unique in any way, other than the fact that he's just a big boy. Okay, you're drooling. You're drooling on the workbench. Really? You're actually... You, you are... You have no shame. Put that butt down. Put that butt down. You're so bad. Thank you. All right. Now, are you going to behave? Are you going to be Mr. Behavior, or are you going to be a good boy? Very cute. Thank you. Very sweet. I think I know how this is going to go. Okay, well, where was I? Edge bevelers. <laughs> so as I said, I have two Berry King edge bevelers. I have a 
size zero, and a size zero zero. The zero zero is the smallest one they make, and I wish they made just a little bit smaller, but that's still good enough. These tools occupy kind of a unique position in that I do not use them for everything I make. And in fact, I find myself using them less and less these days because I do more and more alligator and edge painted projects. And I don't, I don't bevel the edges of things I edge paint because losing that hard edge, you lose uh, the benefit of using surface tension to hold your paint in place. And that actually becomes much more difficult to edge paint them when the edge is round. So I, uh, I prefer these ones. And you should be having fun on the roller coaster rather than watching this. That's, that's my mother-in-law. She's taking my wife to uh, Cedar Point today. So get out of here, nerd. Go have fun. But I include these tools specifically because a lot of people starting off are looking to do things with veg tan and, you know, burnished and, and beveled edges. And unlike the other ones, um, these I include more as an example of uh, the difference between a good one and a bad one. Even a mediocre edge beveler, there is a significant difference between these good ones and even, you know, the kind of middle ground ones, I think. Uh, I start off with this one, the, the venerable uh, Tandy Craft Tool Edge Beveler, and right out, of the, right out of the box, I was annoyed at how badly this tool worked. This tool is bad. This is a bad tool. And I say that because it is, uh, it is one of the, uh, unfortunately, very common tools that you arrive out of the box unsharpened. Uh, and... That's a bit unfair because technically you could say this tool was actually sharpened, but boy, did they do a bad job of it. Wow, it was abysmal. Uh, and I learned, unfortunately, much later that you kind of have to go in and improve that edge to get any real benefit from this, which I did later. But even with that, uh, this is the Tandy size 2 beveler. And I don't know why, but size 2 is the smallest they make. Now, you would have thought that they would have at least gone to, like, size 1 or size 0 or even size 0, zero that, like, Barry King did, which is still a little silly. But, no, size 2 is the smallest the craft tool sells on their website. Now, maybe they sell them smaller in person. I don't know. But if you go to their, go to Tandy's, you know, store page, size 2 is the smallest of the craft tool bevelers you get. And it's huge. It is monstrously big. Uh, I'll try to do a, let's see if I have something that's big enough here that I can actually do this on. I might have to go into my crap drawer here. Hang on. Or into my waste basket, actually. Oh, yeah, here we go. Let me, uh, let me trim this edge here. Yeah, it's, it's monstrous. Trim this edge down real quick. This is some thick stuff here. Holy moly. So this here, now this is, bear in mind, this is after I've actually sharpened mine, which is no easier said than done, considering that, you know, the blade is shrouded as it is. So you kind of have to figure out how to do that. Unfortunately, there are a couple uh, easy ways of at least stropping this. I've actually only sharpened the bottom of it and then stropped the inside, but still. So this is, uh, you can see right off the bat how much it's, even after me sharpening it, it's still binding up on there. It does. It is really unhappy about me trying to do that. Let me trim the other side. I feel like that was still a bit unfair. Let me trim it again here. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it one more time to see if I can get it better than that. And one of the tricks I learned for actually stropping these is you can take. If you can get it to do a long enough piece, you can actually take it, kind of press it, and run it over the inside edge after you've uh, sharpened the outside of it. That actually is a little bit better. But you can still see that's, that's quite a large, that's quite a large strip to bevel off. So this, naturally, is just much too big for anything that I'm using. 
It is absolutely huge. Whereas, even the uh, larger of the two sizes I have, the, the size zero Berry King Beveler, is significantly daintier than that. Hey, Wilton! Trim it again here. We'll, we'll do one with the. Uh, you know what? I'll do. I'll do both sides here. I'll do. I'll do one side with the zero. One side with the zero zero. So these are the Barry King tools. So here's the zero first. And that thing just glides right through it. So right off the bat, you can see how much daintier that is. Here's the other the smaller one. This is the one that I use most often. That actually just glides right through it. So these tools I only use when I'm burnishing edges. And like I said, getting into more and more edge painted stuff, I find myself using them less and less. But again, the, the purpose of their inclusion in this list is to demonstrate that um, a good one is significantly different than a cheap one. So... Certainly, if you're just beginning out, you can try the cheap one. But these are still, I think these are still like 20, 25 bucks from Tainted. They're not particularly cheap. And they're, they're terrible. They're bad. They're categorically not good tools. So for, in, in, my, in my opinion, not a great leap in price uh, from like 25 to like 60. So it is, it, it is double the price. Uh, you certainly get more than double the price worth of functionality out of it. Like These tools come very sharp out of the box. So immediately they are ready to work, and they will hold that edge for a very long time. And it only takes ruining one edge to you know, lose all value in this tool here, whereas I, I, have, I have yet, God willing, never ruined an edge with either one of these things. So a bit of a... Bit of a different take on that at the end there but that's kind of my uh my thought on these ones if you're looking to get into this and you want to get a an edge bevel or do yourself a favor and just get a good one i have heard that the palo santo bevelers are equivalent to the berry kings i have never used one i know they're about the same price but my suspicion would be if i had to guess i think the berry king ones are, are going to be better i just having used so many of their tools i i have complete faith in their ability to produce a, a superior tool. So that sums it up there. Those were the uh, those were the hand tools I really want to talk a, a good bit about. Again, notable because of its absence, uh, skiving knife. I, I get this is another one I think people make a big deal out of. Um, I think even the the basic. Uh, Oh, Steve, yeah, the size zero, 0 is what you want. So on the left, this is the 0. This is the size zero, 0. This is the strip from the 0. This is the little curly strip from the zero, 0. I use the zero, 0. But they do make a smaller one, if you're looking for that. But as I was going to say about skiving knives, I think much is made of these. I've come to the conclusion that the only real advantage between a $100 skiving knife and a $50 skiving knife is one will hold an edge longer, but they both cut about the same. And I don't really use them that much anymore. Uh, because hilariously, here I am talking about the, the value of inexpensive tools. Uh, I don't use a skiving knife. I bought a $1,500 bell skiver. So I cut my leather with my $5 Stanley knife, and I feed them into the $1,500 machine to then take them down a half a milliliter. So it's kind of ironic. So it's all about... It all has to do with your individual need and what particular application, what you know, kind of product you're making. I work on a more production-oriented scale, so saving the time in skiving and having it do a better job than I can matters quite a lot to me, so it was worth that asking price. Somebody on a hobbyist basis, you don't need a bell skiver, but they sure are nice. So if you're looking to drop that kind of money, uh, don't hesitate. They're they're good. They're very, very good. But as far as the skiving knife goes, I wouldn't pay more than 50 bucks for one. 
I have uh, Ben's leftover paint scraper, which I believe is the, the Nobuyushi from Rocky Mountain Leather. It's whatever they have for 50, 60 bucks. Works just fine. Holds an edge pretty adequately for how, how little I need to use it. There's another thing I wanted to do today. That that about covers my hand tool talk, unless anybody has any, any pertinent questions that they like to ask. I actually had something I, I have to do today, and I thought maybe I would do it on stream, because I'm a fool. Uh, I started working on an inventory wallet. I finished up most of my orders. I have just one order remaining, and I was waiting on materials to get here. And I finally did, late, late last week, after I'd already started on this one. But I've been working on an inventory piece, a nice olive drab Minerva box and olive matte crocodile skin, bifold. And I got pretty far in it until I realized I did not have uh, the right color of edge paint. I only had forest or spruce green edge paint rather than olive edge paint. And there's a lot of talk going around now in particular about mixing your own paint. So I thought I would mix some paint on stream just to show how much I hate mixing paint. Uh, people get this idea that oh I'm just gonna buy I'm just gonna buy the three the three primer I'm gonna buy red green and blue and I'm gonna mix every color I need and uh, good luck I wish you best of luck mixing paint is not a fun task I did it for a long time professionally and uh, it's a pain and it is not as straightforward as you think it is That's an absolutely good point, Tom. If you're one of those madmen who uses the skiving knife for everything, then yes, having one that holds an edge longer than that is valuable. But I would, uh, again, I would just come back to just using the, uh, the Stanley knife for that. Less cost of entry for basically the same effectiveness, but again, to each their own. I know people do that. I don't know how. I have no idea how people use the skiving knife like that. I tried. I was like, I'm going to hurt myself doing it this way. <laughs> Holding that knife the way they do, like, I am going to injure myself with that. That is insane to me. But people do it, and they do it very well, so it must be me. <laughs> but like I was saying, I thought I would try mixing up some paint here on stream. So if you'll bear with me for a moment, I'm going to grab a, a bowl and a paper towel to clean up with. And we'll see if we can't come up with a close approximation of an, of an OD green edge paint. So give me a minute. I'll be right back. I'm just going to grab a, I'm going to go dampen a paper towel and get a little dish here and we'll, we'll see if we can mix something up that's suitable. Okay, I generally, I don't often have to mix or tint paint, but generally when I'm doing it, I'm doing it on a very, very small scale, usually for like a single edge at a time. Uh, for this one, I, I intend to do the whole wallet with it, so I'm actually going to mix up um, a, a more sizable portion of it. And still, in the end, probably not all that much, but I have one of these older bottles of uh, that I bought from Alan Valentine for edge application, uh, the needle bottles. I think, that's, I think they're pretty clever. Water out of that. I think it's a pretty clever way of doing it. I ultimately did not find that method suited me, but I know plenty of people do. Uh, I'm still, still an unabashed finger painter, so forgive me. Rube, if you're watching, I know that gives you fits, but it, uh, it does work for me. So, do each their own. As I said, I need to make all of drab, so I'll grab uh, I have some crap right here for it. Do I? Where did I put it? Oh, I put it in the actual scrap drawer. Go figure. So I want to get as close to this as I can. This is the olive Minerva box. Lovely stuff. Oh my god, is it beautiful. Uh, I, every time I 
I come back to using Minerva for something. I'm like, oh my god, I need to use this more often. It is it is just just a delightful leather to work with. And I'm working with it in uh, half a millimeter thickness. I'll show you where I'm at so far. I have these two pockets made up. These are all ready to go, but I need to paint those inside edges there. And as you can see, I did them in the spruce just to get some paint on there to seal it, but it's just not right. It isn't, it isn't right. I toyed with doing it in a brown and stitching it in brown, but I kind of, I, I really want to do it with, I really want the olive edges. I really want to do it with, with olive to, to match, have a full monotone wallet, because I just, I, I enjoy that. I think that looks very fetching. So, I'm going to try to mix some up today. To make olive drab, you would think that you'd be trying to get into green colors. You know, so blues and yellows to mix it, but you'd actually be incorrect. Uh, the primary components for mixing olive drab are black and yellow, which surprised the hell out of me to learn, but I learned this many years ago when I was doing uh, painting model airplanes. Now, if you run out of OD green, black and yellow will immediately make an, a, a close analog of OD green. So we're going to start with that. You know what strikes me, Tom, about it? It has a, almost like a hay smell. It smells like an animal, almost. I get distinct notes of hay from certain certain hides of Minerva box, and I just find that so cool. It just has such a unique smell to it. I, I love it. Let's go ahead. What a delightful sound. I'm going to... Good bit of black in there. And when I was mixing paint professionally for, for cars, I had a, a scale that would measure down to a tenth of, par of a part. I actually measured everything in parts, not in ounces. It was uh, kind of funny. And I'm going to go light on the yellow, because it's easy to go overboard with it. Start light with yellow here. Uh, Johan, that is all half a millimeter. So that's half a millimeter folded over for basically one millimeter thick at its thickest, and it's skived on the edges there. You can see that's turning green already. But we need... Need a bit more yellow, I think. Like I said, I know some people have been toying with the idea of mixing all of their edge paint colors every time they want to do it. Take note of this. You've got a lot of this ahead of you, my friend. That's starting to brighten up a bit. That's becoming more olive. It's actually pretty good. Still, still more sprucey than olive. Add. I'm gonna add a little bit more yellow. With certain yellows, you can do one to one black to yellow to create OD green. This yellow is pretty. It's it's got a. strong kind of yellow oxide look to it so it ends up being a little more neon-y when you do it one-to-one -one. i think that's about as green as we're going to get out of that and get that that's black and yellow i know roger you would not think that thank you johan that's very kind of you and also, while I'm thanking people, uh, thank you to those of you who uh, who very kindly donated by hitting the uh, the super thanks button on the last stream. Uh, I have a kind of a small fund going for an additional camera to use for the Bell Skyver. So those of you who, who were who were very generous, it is appreciated very much. Thank you very much for your generosity. Very very kind of you. So I think I'm going to add a drop of white here. 
And white, you have to be very careful with. White will do more than just lighten colors. It will actually, when you're mixing paint with white, it will desaturate them. So you have to be very sparing with white. We're just going to add a couple drops in. Let's see what that does. Okay, that's get that's getting us close. And that actually what that did, that brought out more adding those couple drops of white brought out more of the yellow than anything else, but it did brighten it up a little bit. I'm going to add a few more drops. See where we're at. Spent a lot of time standing over a scale pouring out drop by drop. Interesting thing about paint, there is no exact color match when you're painting a car. I mean, there are guys who can get it very, very, very close, but it's a lot of work and it's much more difficult than you would think. So generally, if you're having a car painted or repaired or something like that, nine times out of ten, you're going to end up blending something. Uh, the only times that's changed has actually been in the past year or two, when uh, I know Sherwin-Williams and... Our supplier, PPG, started getting some really advanced color matching cameras that will actually generate a formula on the spot. Those are very cool. Those are pretty recently uh, introduced, at least to our area. I know they've been in, in bigger cities for a little bit. We only just got access to that kind of stuff. The idea of getting an exact color match, even with an exact mix, uh, is uh, impossible. And the mix will vary depending on the total amount you mix. Certain colors have to be mixed in a certain minimum amount. To begin to get close to it, which is very frustrating. When you get a car and you need to paint like a single fender in the uh, mix format, it tells you, oh, you need to mix like, you need to mix half a gallon to paint one fender. It's very, very frustrating. Nowadays, with uh, the supply situation being what it is, it's a mess. All right, so we've got. That's still a very yellowy, sprucey kind of green, but what I'm going to do, I have this piece of scrap here. Let's do a swatch on there, because the way the paint looks when it is liquid will be very different from how it looks when it dries. So we're going to put a drop on there and see what that looks like. That's on the camera, that looks pretty close, actually, but that's still more, more yellowy than I want. I think I want to add... Drop a brown to it. We'll start building up drop by drop brown. Two drops. That's all I'm going to add. If you can see it in there, that's it. That's all I'm going to do to it right now. Stir it up, mix it, see what it looks like. But that's getting us in the right direction. So I'm going to go ahead and add a couple more drops. Two. I'm going to do a third one. Three. How that looks. Ah, I see. Now that there, those little bits of brown got us much closer. That got us out of the uh, the green green and more into the olive green. Take my... bit here. Right off the bat. Again, I fear that very little of the nuance for that is coming through on the camera, but um, very visible to me. Spread this out a little bit to 
gets to dry a little quicker. You can just begin to see on the outside edges of the first one I did that it's starting to dry, and it's very blue-toned compared to this. We want it to get more, more red tone in it. And that brown is where we're getting our red tone. These are the Havana, which is a very kind of warm, almost coppery kind of brown. And that gave us the, uh, the red tones we needed. I could have added just a straight red to it, but I fear it would have been a little too much. should be. Plenty of paint. Now this is thrilling content right here. I'm literally streaming watching paint dry, I know. But from what I can see now, it's actually still there's still more red in there than I more blue in there than I want. I'm actually gonna go ahead. Even though it looked pretty close while wet, once it dries, that blue really comes out. Come on. There we go. Again, for people considering mixing their own paint all the time, are we having fun yet? <laughs> Does this look fun to you yet? I think I'm going to do a little more, try a couple more drops of white, too. Yeah, Tom, I think you've got the right idea. <laughs> All of this because I didn't want to spend nine bucks for a uh, for another bottle. Yeah, Pequod, we used to have. I had a like I said a scale, and ours was measured in tenths of parts. I had a big mixing station, and we had the big. We had ever all our toner in gallons and quarts, and ours had the uh, the trigger tops, so you could get it down once you had the the paint down at the bottom of the nozzle. You could just get that that lid open just enough to where drop by drop by drop it would measure down and you'd be able to measure it down to the, the nth of a part to get the mix right. I always enjoyed the pearl powders. Those were always the most fun to me. It's basically like holding a bottle of talcum powder and tapping on the bottom until you sit there tap it for half an hour and finally get a, a whole part out of it. When you saw something that you used like 60, 60 parts of pearl, you'd be like, oh my god, that's like three bottles of pearl. So let's see, we've got it. So there's our trying to get the right light on here. I wonder if, wonder if it'll be any better with my bench lights. Let's see. Probably not. Oh, it is a little bit actually, so. So once they've dried, you can kind of see what we've got there. So this was the one, the first one we did on the left here. Here's the second one with some a bit of brown in it. Now here's the third one with a lot more brown, a bit of white. Spread that out so it dries better. Again, looking at that while, uh, while wet, it looks pretty good, but it's going to be totally different once it dries. Still, I think I'm in the right ballpark. A lot of yellow in that still now. 
but we'll see how much of that shows up once it dries. It looks very yellow when it's wet and very blue when it's dry. So I knew this color would be very, very frustrating to mix. So far, it is not, uh, not disappointing. In the meantime, I'll just keep stirring it. While we're waiting for this thrilling, uh, thrilling channel content here, what are you guys working on today? Anybody got any good projects going on? What do you, what do you got on your bench? What are you making this week? Let me know. Getting better. Getting there. Still needs more brown. More white. Tell even this advanced stage of drying. Needs more of both of those. Oh, I've been filming, Tom. God bless you. Good luck. I hope you had better luck than I did. A four pocket wallet, natural veg. Andrew, I, I'd be curious, what is your preferred natural veg tan? Because it's something I want to do more of. I really like the look of natural veg, and I know it's um it's certainly a strong seller. Folks who like that patina look. And I've used um natural batero, or at least what, what is sold as natural batero here. And I've been very disappointed with it. It's very yellow, fleshy looking. I don't like the way it looks. I've been very disappointed with my, my experience uh, with natural Batero. I'd be curious here, to hear what you're using. I've thought about going with some of the natural glazed harness from Wicket and Craig, but that brings with it its own complications. What else do we have? Equad, God bless you. Uh, take note today. <laughs> I wish you all the luck in the world. Stephanie, thank you very much. Yeah, edge painting sucks. Uh, and I'm still trying to refine my, my technique. I would I would not call myself an edge painting master. I think I'm pretty passable at it. I think I'm pretty good at it for doing it so much. I think the person who does the best edges in the business actually is uh, Tang. Tang Handcraft. I think his edges are the best. Trying to get on, on his level. Carol Modus is my mother. I've been helping her set up, uh, after I very cruelly laid her off when I, I quit my job, uh, we've been trying to, uh, get her established with her, uh, with her artist page. She's been doing a lot of pet portraits recently. So she is, uh, up the street from me painting. She very kindly made me breakfast today. So thank you very much, Mom. <laughs> So this one's drying down, and you can see that one we just did compared to the one that's next to it. Even though it looks pretty pretty warm on the leather, it's just drying blue. Drying straight up blue green. No matter how much how much I add to it there, it keeps doing that. So I think I'm actually gonna go in and do. Why not? We've tried, we've tried warming it up with brown, with a red brown, but it's not it's still very, very cool. This is actually a feniche or fennis, whatever you want to call it, but I think they're close enough to where 
mixing them together in this uh, application is not going to cause me problems. Wow, that was disintegrating. I think I'll be able to mix these together without repercussions. I'm only going to use a couple drops of red. I, I'm i glad that you mentioned that because I know a lot of people, rather I get the impression that many people are not finishing their projects. I prefer the uh, the Saffir Medeo Dior, the, the Pate Deluxe, Pate Deluxe, yeah, you can tell I speak French, the Pate Deluxe in neutral. Uh, and I, I really like the effect that gives. Uh, I know that um, a good friend of mine, a firecracker on uh, Instagram, she does primarily uh, painted leather, painted natural veg, and she swears by the, uh, the, the Tandy European bends. And I actually, I went over to her shop and I saw some of it. And I have to say, I was extremely impressed with the Tandy uh, European veg tan. It was beautiful. I thought it was better than uh, the Herman Oak I had used. I was very, very impressed with that. It's just a shame they don't split it terribly thin, or at least they didn't last time I was doing it. How how thin are you able to get it from them? Ideally, I'd like to get it around like one to two ounces, but I don't think they go that low. We're walking it back. We're walking. It's this one is drying better. Still not where I want it, but it's better than it was. I think I'm going to keep going in with the red. At this point, I have really nothing to lose. Again, agonizingly slowly, a drop at a time there. If you go too far, you have gone too far. I watched um, a video of Christine McConnell. Very, very... She's a fantastic uh, macabre artist. And artisan. I mean, it, she does so much, it's, it's remarkable. But uh, a lot of baking, a lot of uh, home DIY, things like that. She, she bought a house. And uh, it had this beautiful natural, or natural. It had this beautiful original wallpaper, with a floral pattern on it, but it had been damaged by water. And she uh, took it upon herself to repair it by painting it by hand back to where it had to go. And uh, she has a pretty good, pretty good video on her mixing her paint to match it. Quite remarkable to see to see her do it. I think I'm going to go in with more white. Whoop, well, that one just got on my... Oh, nice one. If I was intelligent, I'd have put my wax paper underneath this. But I'm not. Why I keep the... paper towel handy. Yeah, Tandy actually has some good tannages if you know which ones to get. Like I said, that European bend, I think, is uh, is really killer. And kind of unknown. I don't see a lot of people working with it. It would probably fare well in my crank splitter if I could get it down to the consistent enough weight. I have half a mind to 3D print some new gears for it to tighten up the jaws on it, but... Uh, Just another thing on the list of things I haven't done yet. <laughs> you can see we've done one, two, three, four, five individual swatches on this piece here just to try to get to something that I'm satisfied with. And I'm actually almost there. I'm not really trying to get a dead nuts match here. I just want to get close. And really the thing that I'm looking at is not so much the whether it's light or dark. If it's lighter or darker, I'm okay with that. What I really don't want is the blue tone in it. 
really want to get out of that blue. I think I've added enough red. I think I'm going to go back. I think I'm going to go heavy with the brown now. I think I'm finally... I think my hue is right. I think I'm close. I think if I overcorrect a little bit with this, it will still be okay. I'm going to go on. Six, six good sized drops of the brown there. Yeah, they're natural, uh, they're, like I said, they're craftsman shoulders were the first leather I ever bought. And actually, I got very good use out of it. Oh, Pequot, well, trust me, I know all about that. I think that last bit of brown put me over the threshold where I needed to be, because I can see now a noticeable tone shift in this. I think that's it. I think that's the one. Like I said, I, I lived the life of quote-unquote easily replicable colors. <laughs> Never again. Yeah, see, that's... You can kind of see there, starting from the top left to the top right, how we get the shift from very blue and dark to lightening up, getting more into, into a, a good tonal match to this. We're actually looking... While it's wet here, we're looking almost almost brown against the green there, which is good because that's going to flash down into a, you know, that blue's going to come back out as it dries. I think that's it. I think I'm going to call it at that. I'm not going to make anybody watch me dry paint any more than this, so I'm going to go ahead and do the hilarious task of trying to not make a mess of pouring this into the, uh, the little bottle here. I'll tell you how we're I'll tell you what we're gonna do. That should that should kind of hold it. I think. Ooh, what do you think? Yeah, that'll work. Give it one last good stir up there. I'll try and do it more over the uh, over the camera there. Scrape it off the bottom. No mess yet. Like I said, I think I'm going to wrap it up here after this. Uh, any questions about anything I covered today, please do ask. Like I said, now would be the time to get me directly. But also, anything uh, afterwards, you know, do leave in the comments. I do, uh, do respond to every comment that I get, so I do appreciate it. To uh, all the new folks who came in, you know, thank you again for joining me today. I, I do greatly appreciate the company. Like I said, I am home alone today. My wife is out having a great time riding roller coasters. That's just not my speed. By uh, the company is always uh, greatly valued. I realize some of the things I said as far as the tool choices may be a little controversial, but that's good. I think that's a good conversation to have. And I hope that any of you who are looking to, to start leather work, I hope that I was able to save you from spending a lot of money where I think you probably don't need to. So I hope that uh, hope that you found that beneficial. I think I certainly could have used that uh, advice when I started out. So I tried to kind of oriented towards that. My regulars, again, thank you so much for spending this uh, early part of the afternoon with me. Here, I think that's about as much as I'm going to be able to get out of that.
while this is still wet, I'll just run some water through it, and that'll clean that up pretty good there. But that there, that should be enough to do that wall with. If I need to mix up a little bit more, I have a pretty good idea of where I need to get with it. Like I said, generally when I'm doing this, I'm doing it on a much smaller scale. I intentionally decided to mix up some more of it today to kind of have it to do this entire wallet with all in one go. But if I ever need to touch it up or, or finish up something up, I'll know at that point that I'm basically just a couple drops of, of this color and that color, and it'll be close enough to where the naked eye won't be able to tell. But I'm actually pretty pleased with that. It's starting to, to flash over there, and you can see down at the bottom there, that's almost... That's almost dead nuts on there. It's hard to pick that out against the green there, so I'm going to call that good enough. I think I'm going to take a break today and enjoy this beautiful weather while we've got it, because it is supposed to get extremely hot tomorrow. I think I'm going to enjoy... I think I'm going to take my car for a ride. Oh, it actually rained a little bit, my word. It actually rained a little bit. I didn't even notice it. Well, that just saved me the trouble of having to... Having to wash it too much. Uh, I'm I'm glad that uh, glad that my word of warning came at a, an appropriate time for you. I wish you all the luck in the world with your paint mixing adventure. Let me know how it goes. I'm genuinely curious. Like I said, even though I'm out of the painting industry, I'm still adjacent enough to it to have a great interest in it. So let me know how that works out for you. Uh, to everybody else again, thank you very much for watching. Uh, what what do they what do the YouTubers say? What do the kids say? They'll like and subscribe and. If you're so inclined, hit the super thanks button, I guess. Or the best thing is, uh, if you're on the fence, buy a wallet from me. But I think most of you are other leather workers, so go make your own. Have a good day.